but she's taking a look at the ways in which people communicate, use language, use vocabulary to express deeper philosophy. In the case of firefighting, if you think of the second word in that phrase, you've got a, a word fighting, and yet these people understand the ecological ramifications of fire. And so she's trying to tease that apart, understand how language is used within a context of, ec of deeper ecological understanding. She's also creating a website that you see in a moment. She may not mention this, although I'll try to do that. Yeah. 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 Oh, by the way, um, timing's got kind of screwed up, as I mentioned earlier, the introduction. Bethany's going to take advantage of this and extend her talk with a workshop, immediately her talk will, will segue into a workshop. So this talk will go in, until for roughly about an hour. But the, the talk portion is uh, a, a fraction of that. It will be a, a group activity workshop kind of thing. Later and there are some other sessions that start, I think, at um, 10 30. So we won't put my feelings in here. So I, uh, I'm going to just start off by giving a couple people some thanks. Um, this is my thesis presentation. I, I will extend and finish my actual thesis next term. But I want to give a shout out to Jared Aldrin, up front here. He's my graduate mentor. I started this program I keep on, in 2005. And I, I part time, and I went a couple of years and took a large handful of years off. And he's back last year. Jared's been through, through it all with me. He's shown just an amazing amount of it. Insight and patience. Thank you, Jared. Um, big shout out to Peter, too. I'm really thankful that I did come back and have the opportunity to, to work on him. And then I, I wanted to recognize my brother over here at Friends. Um, he's been helpful with the project, he's been helping with the transcription. And um, he's the guy I call when I'm struggling to work with ideas. So thank you. So the story of Wild and Fire has been told in a variety of different forms and formats. It's told through the history of our land management agencies like the Forest Service. It's told through the media. Yeah. Every summer we hear stories about fire. And it's told, it's, it's told through our landscapes in, in the rings of the trees. What I find interesting about fire is the language that's used, the vernacular. And the Smoky Generation is a project that's really kind of rooted in understanding that language. And it does so through the collection, preservation, and sharing of stories about fire by firefighters on this website that I've created called the Smoke Generation .com. Without going into the history of, of, of wild and fire and the history of uh, fire exclusion and um, suppression in the US, um, it's just important to note that, that through a, a history of about 100 years of land management decisions and fire management decisions, we've changed the, the makeup of our forest. Um, and in doing so, we've changed the way fires burn. So we're seeing um, fires burning longer as far as fire seasons. We're seeing that they're putting more values at risk in some cases. And we're seeing that there's a larger, higher potential for fire growth. Um, historically, we've looked at fire through the lens of the forestry and fire science. Um, and that has brought about you know, some really good changes in how we manage fire. Um, but Politics and bureaucracy often dictate how we fight fire when it comes down to it. And what drives politics often is the public perception of fire. So I know the belief that we need to look at fire, not just from a scientific aspect, but also from a social and cultural aspect. So what I chose to do with the project is um, examine the stories of hotshots, which are uh, a specific type of firefighter, the language they use, and, and how that reflects how we view the role of fire in the environment. I chose to limit my studies to, to hotshots and wildland firefighters because I think their stories can help um, you know, shape the public discourse around fire. And in doing so, hopefully influence the public perception of fire, which will then influence the policies that we put into action on the ground. So at the heart of this project is this, this website that I've created, collecting and sharing the stories. 
but the analysis piece is really looking at the language that they're using and seeing what it says about their beliefs. Um, so for the presentation, I, I have put together some hidden web, web pages on the site. Um, so I'm going to, just for some visuals, so I'm going to go ahead and um, take you through these kind of hidden pages, and then I'll show you the public facing side of the site at the end of the presentation. So my thesis question is, what tropes and genes do hotshots most commonly use when describing fire and environment, and what means and values are revealed through those figures of speech? So I'm looking at the language and trying to figure out in these stories what exactly they're trying to say. I've split the project into three objectives. Basically, the first objective is to create this compilation of oral histories and stories so that they can be used by academics and historians and, and the general public. The second objective is basically to take a look at that language. And the third objective is realizing that this website can kind of be a piece of that puzzle that drives perceptions about fire. Um, how can we leverage the website to kind of create this more balanced acceptance of fire in the environment? So we'll start with objective one here, which again is collecting the, uh, the stories and sharing the stories. So I drove about 4,500 miles. I collected 25 hours of audio and video interviews and spoke to about 46 different people, mainly, mainly hotshots, although there's some social numbers in there because Keep them away from the camera. It's um, a great story. How do you know if someone ever walks into a bar? Don't worry, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I used a um, I used ethnographic interviewing uh, techniques and oral history interviewing techniques. Ethnographic interviewing essentially focuses on the meanings that people assign to actions and events within their own cultural world. world as in their own language. So it takes on more of a conversational interview style. Oral history is really focused on capturing those narratives about and details from specific events or, or life um, and then getting their reflections on that. So um, I had a combination of, of different types of questions to kind of elicit the story. So this bigger picture here is just a picture of a typical setup. I would roll into a hotshot base and they stick me into a room. And then the picture over on the right is uh, just a screenshot of the web page where these uh, interviews are, are captured. And I'll show you later. So the types of questions that I, I asked were, again, a combination. So really an intellectual question, like how do you perceive the little things of fire environment? How do you perceive the value of the work? But there's also questions like, tell me your favorite hotshot story. You know, what was the fire doing? When were you the most proud? Um, so really a combination of questions. And again, the, the ultimate goal was to elicit stories, um, just to, to get, uh, get material to then analyze. I have some examples down here. I'm going to skip by them just for the sake of time. If we have time at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll show you um, some, of the, some of the examples of responses. So the next objective is to identify and analyze the figures of Speech. Now, before I dive in um, to my to my results, I want to do a group exercise, and this is going to require um, splitting into two groups and um, taking a look at, at images and, and just kind of cataloging cataloging the responses to images. How many of you have um, experienced good Wi-Fi today? Yeah. Okay. Um, the idea behind this group exercise was to split into two groups and, and be able to look at our device and the picture, but um, testing it out earlier. One, is it? Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, I think, I think I'll, I'll kind of make things up a little bit. Um, what I would like to do is, is show, show images um, and have one side of the room respond, and I'll write them up on the board, and then uh, we'll, we'll show a different set of images to the other side of the room, and we'll, we'll just do it that way. So what I'm looking for, um, I have a pretty big slide, but for, for you, you want to go inside? All right. So what I'm looking for is um, basically your reaction, your perception of the fire shown on the image. And I'm looking for that kind of instant response, um, so, so that emotional response to the fire. And we're just going to have you kind of speak out which works topic 
into your mind. So if it's um, scary or beautiful or healthy or destructive, I'm just going to shout it out. Can I maybe have a volunteer to write down the words? Come on. For this side of the room, you're going to be group one. Which one? Okay, so for this image, what comes to mind? Don't be shy. What's that? Oh my god. Emotional response. Shit. Panic. We'll switch to the next one. Maybe with a line. Yeah. Go ahead and just just speak freely. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Thought. Really. Switch to the next. Emotional, like, is it a gut check? Oh, lost. Lost. Next picture. Whoa. Massive. Massive. Anything else? Just jump, okay. What was it? Blow up. Blow up. This is really disturbing, but it looks like home. So familiar, maybe. Out of control. Out of control? That might be the resolution of the photo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go just a few more here. Explosive. Explosive. Angry. Angry, right? Hungry. Hungry. Large. Large. To the other side of the room, I'm going to show you a series of 11 images as well. So, what comes to mind? 
when you see this. Under. Okay. Again, that emotional response, that instant warmth. Fuel. We'll move to the next. Similar. Any any response? Control. Control. Three. Hug. Beautiful. Prescribed. Change. Change. Great. Four. Isn't quite getting the same emotional response as the other images, huh? What about this one? Well, it worked all natural. Natural. Great. Okay. Okay. Creeping. Creeping. Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> Congestion? Congestion. Nine. Smoky. Limited. Limited. Okay. Stark. Changing. Gone. One more time. Gone. 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 New girl. Last one. Group one. Any any help with this? Over there. <laughs> Over there. As in not here. Not here. Walk around it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as we went through the image uh, images, you'll notice Group one photos were showing kind of residentially threatening or larger fire behavior, and group two were showing more ecologically responsible fire, right? Maybe fire that we would expect in natural conditions. The, this exercise really breaks down the issue of wildland fire into really simplistic terms, right? Good fire versus bad fire. Mm -hmm. And you just absolutely cannot look at fire in such unrealistic, simplistic um, terms. But you know, in looking at the results of the exercise, we do have some really interesting language. Um, consuming, we have choking, blow up, uh, desolate. We have some great, you know, awesome, but panic, hard to breathe. So, so some, some emotions were evoked from those images. And over here we have a few kind of antagonist terms, but not as many. Um, so, I just wanted to convey, and, and we, I think you guys are all, you know, we're all environmental studies students, or we have this you know, environmentally um, co conscious um, outlook on, on fire, but um, even we had some language that we decided on that is, is negative and antagonistic, and that actually um, remains true across the board. So just, I'm going to flip through these images side by side, just to kind of um, hammer home the point that these images we're actually of the same fire. So we're seeing um, more emotional descriptive language when we're seeing larger, more threatening fire behavior versus natural fire. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the images we're taking at the same time or the same point in the fire, but it just does show that fire is a complex issue. Was there a question? Yeah. I noticed that the second group of photos were more intimate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Than the first group photos, which just that alone would give you Absolutely, yeah, and, and this is just a very simplistic exercise. Um, yeah, absolutely, the, the camera perspective and the ability to get up close to, to a small fire versus big fire um, makes a difference. This is the Carlton complex. Um, so we have this fire that's, you know, 
leaning over a home, and then we have this beautiful understory burn here going on. This is the largest fire in Washington state history it burned this year. Uh, coffee fire, same fire. We're seeing different fire behavior there. Rowena burns through some homes. Uh, but it also did a lot of good. This is the King Fire. This is a fire that burned up the hill for me. It holds a record for the largest uh, amount of retardant ever dropped on a fire, over 550 million gallons, or I'm sorry, thousand gallons, um, <laughs> that would be a lot, um, almost hundred million dollars just a breath. Where is it? So, Where is that? California, Central California. Slide fire was up the hill from here, I, I believe, so pretty close. The rim fire, uh, you may recognize that, that term, it was the big fire in Yellow, or Yosemite last year, mm -hmm. the biggest smoke column I've ever seen. Um, but there are sections of it that still did some good. Snake Canyon fire. Um, we have this, you know, this big smoke column that's threatening homes, and then we have this beautiful understory that's doing nothing but good for for the, the forest here. Fontenelle fire. There's some great stories about Fontenelle fire on the website, um, and I liked it, Peter, what you said. It was overdue. Um, this I chose this picture because. Because it shows that fire needs to be in here. Waldo Canyon fire. It um, burns about 350 homes and um, cost uh, about 17 million to suppress and caused 450 million of insurance claims. I uh, going back here. I did choose this because this is the type of fire that we want to see around the city. <coughs> this low, um, low to moderate intensity fires to clean up. Uh, fuels around communities. Baldo Canyon. Um, your response was not what I expected on this, um, which which is very interesting to me. This is this is what a lot of people think of when they see a fire going through. They think this kind of everything is just destroyed. Um, when in fact, there's a lot of regeneration that occurs from fires. It's a natural part of the landscape. And the last one, West Fork Complex. Um, Another just really, really big fire um, that had had some some good and bad pieces of it. Um, what I what I really wanted to just showcase though is that you know again we're a, a room full of academics um, and so we're kind of intellectualizing this, but we're still using that emotional language. That's the case with hotshots as well. Even though they have a really intimate understanding of fire and they can clearly articulate the benefits of fire in the environment, they're choosing. Using uh, similar language, they're choosing antistic, antagonistic language and, and often militaristic language when they're describing fire in the environment. So this is what I did for my analysis. I have a little table here. Just in looking at the language, I catalog, I use just basic literary analysis to catalog the figures of speech in the interviews in the story. And, and then I use discourse analysis, which is a way of and conceptualizing and analyzing the language to um, get at the meanings behind what they were saying. And a couple of things came out. The common language that firefighters use, um, just, I'm going to quickly go through some, some broad topics here. The concept of a good fire to a firefighter doesn't necessarily mean an ecological, like ecologically beneficial fire. It doesn't mean they got to go in there and put it out really quickly and do their job well. It usually means that they got their butt kicked. And um, you know, that's a really, really good fire is to be challenged and have to spend a lot of time on it. Um, same with a good shift. A good shift uh, is a shift that was extremely challenging, usually long hours, and, and 16 hours is an average shift. So long hours are 24. Um, there's a sense of shared misery. So everyone was covered in poison oak and it was 105 degrees. So uh, that's a good shift. And um, it results in the sense of accomplishment, regardless of whether or not they met objectives. So um, they, they get a sense of um, empowerment, if you will, just because they, they had to work hard and overcome these challenges, even though their work may um, be burned over or may not be used at all. So that, that's some interesting paradox that came out in, in the stories. There's a lot of personification that happens, uh, descriptions of fires, head of the head of the fire, the most active part of the fire, the flanks of the side, the heels are the inactive point and the figure, fingers of the fires have a little persuasion. There's uh, the concept of fire as a mess that needs to be cleaned up. So language like the fire slopped over 
and we're mopping up the fire. Fire at the display, so it was a hotshot show, so it was a walk-in show, it was an engine show. Um, also, there's a concept of political smokes, which are uh, um, you know, sections of the fire, like a stump out in the middle of the burn that's throwing up a lot of smoke. They go put it out, even though it's not threatening the fire because it's political, because people can see it. Um, so, so it's, you know, again, that idea of fire. Uh, descriptions of fire events have militaristic connotations, so campaign fires, fire sieges. And then there's some really interesting uh, description um, used to describe landscape and fuels. So there's a big old hog or a big old toad up on the hill. It's a big tree that needs to come down, essentially. So there's a lot of that kind of fun descriptive language going on. But what I found out as I went through the story is that there, there's a little bit of a shift between how they describe fire and how they describe firefighting action. So just for example, there is some of that antagonistic language that we saw ourselves. You know, the fire blew up. It was, you know, blasted um, through the hillside. Um, the fire ripped. It nuked. Um, you know, it was a big wall of flame. These are pretty common terms that are used. But there's also a lot of personification that personification carries through. So the fire was running. It was chasing. It was laying down. It stood up in the, the canopy. So I, I can't help but wonder if this kind of personification in firefighter language carries over and is kind of captured by the media when they're portraying fires as, you know, a monster that needs to be dominated or put down or, you know, something out of control. So um, it's just a, you know, kind of an interesting question. How, how is the language affecting um, the media and therefore the, the public perception? But what I found really interesting is that there is a shift when you move into describing firefighter actions. And that shift becomes much more antagonistic. So uh, there's still some personification, but the language is much more aggressive, punching line, beating, smacking down, knocking down, knocking out the fire, putting it to bed, uh, flanking the fires of military strategy, uh, um, nuking off uh, an area, slicking a hillside up. Mm -hmm. These are all firefighters describing other firefighters. Is mm -hmm. languages? They're, they're firefighters describing their their own actions. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or the actions of other firefighters, but okay. primarily their own. It's not the public describing the fire. No. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's the firefighters. So these tables basically just show the, the descriptor kind of the frequency and some examples. But um, what what really kind of fascinated me with this whole, whole project is how does this language that is aggressive jive with how they view the role of fire in the environment? And what I found is that almost to the last, uh, the interviewees believe that fire is a necessary part of the environment. They believe that the policy of suppressing fires for so long has caused a mess. And they really believe that we need more um, fuels management and more fire on the ground. But how they're describing fires that they fight doesn't match up at all. So for example, I'm, I'm just going to play you a couple of examples. So this is Drew. He's on the uh, Sierra Hotshot. And this, I'm going to make sure the volume is up here. And this is what he has to say. See, that one really stood out. It was cranking. It was it's unbelievable how much land that fire can cover, um, even at night. You would think it would die down Quite a bit. Sometimes, majority of the time it does, but sometimes it'll just rip all, all through the night. Especially when it gets established in the bottom of a drainage at night, it'll just speed it up. So, again, you know, the message that he's saying isn't necessarily negative, but if you pull out those pieces, it was cranking, it ripped, it ate it up. That all of a sudden becomes a little bit more aggressive. Um, and it doesn't really reflect what he believes, which is. Is, you know, I think we've suppressed fires for so long, it's making them harder to manage. And he, he says, it was pretty funny, I like suppressing fires, it's fun. <laughs> um, but I think managing the main objectives is better. So here is another example. This is Erin, she's on the Wolf Creek Hot Shots. She's one of three women that I interviewed, and she's the only one that cursed during the interview and belched. So, um, <laughs> so, so which is, I mean, there's 
my very tough to be Bell now. So I was um, not, not, surprised, not surprised to hear cursing, but I was surprised not to hear other people cursing. Um, so she says, so I think that fire's role in the environment is really crucial, and I also think that years of fire suppression is causing a lot of really extreme fire behavior, and it's making fire way more destructive than it would be had a natural burn cycle been allowed to occur. So she's really clearly articulating her beliefs here. But then when she just describes uh, this great story about a fire she fought, this is what she says. Back to where we get started, and then we start to see you know, these big, sort of steep, but still rolling hills. And we start to see this smoke come up from below where we had started. And then we just see this wall of flame, like, shoot up, paralleling the line that we've been cold trailing. And just like, but of course, in that situation is scary, but you just go further into the black and you're totally fine. But it just, you know, just a wall of flame. Like, where the fuck did that come from? And, uh, you know, it was just because they had just missed something really, that crew blow us and did something really minor and it just completely blown out. Just like, like I said, extremely volatile. I'm not sure what the story was that year, but, um, and um, it was ranch land. And so these ranchers, um, so that first shift, we like, we were just running all over the place and uh, just trying things that just didn't work. And um, but it's in that really cool kind of fuel type that uh, uh, you know you get these spectacular burnouts. It looks like you know, the world's coming to an end, and then it's all totally over, and within seconds. And then like you know, like a couple chains back, you can just hop, hop right into it because it's already cold and it's like a safety. So she, you know, again, the message that she's saying isn't necessarily negative. She's just describing an experience. But, but she, you know, she compares certain fire behavior to looking like the world is coming to an end. Um, so not quite jiving the way you would expect. Um, I'll show you just uh, one more here. This is uh, Rigo, who's on the flight deck shots. And he, you know, again, says it's definitely part of the environment and needs to continue to be a part of the environment. And he's talking about a a story um, about a fire in the Dakotas. Let's see if we can get, get in here. It's, it's fun to go up there. They have some good fires. And then if you go into the eastern part of Montana, you get into the grasslands, and you get some really good grass fires out there. So we had one last year, I think it was. I'll just pause it. So what he's saying, we got some really good grass fires. He's saying it was really fun for him as a firefighter because they were challenged and it was big fire. Not necessarily good for the environment, but it was good for him. Um, near the, the Dakotas, but on the borderline of Montana and Dakotas, and it was a it was a rager that was seventy foot flame lengths off the grass, and um, probably had about a sixty to seventy mile an hour wind behind it, and just pushing in all different directions, and a lot of chaos for sure. Um, there's homes involved. Huge wall of flames just slams right into a bunch of homes. Luckily, they didn't burn down. Um, they had a lot of resources there that, that were prepared for it. So, and they had to plumb, and um, um, they were definitely ready for it. But it's just so same same deal. And this was really across the board. A little bit of uh, aggressive language, but really strong beliefs about um, fire in the environment. Um, so there's 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 a gap there, um, and it's it's very Interesting. So these people who, who, you know, by all rights should be champions of fire, should be champions of more fire on the, the landscape so that we can have healthier forests. They're, they're not telling stories that really support that. Um, so the, the question really becomes, like, why? And there's a, a lot of answers I need to explore a little bit more. One reason might be that um, fire suppression in its current form hasn't been around very long. We're talking you know, 100, 110 years. But the ecological understanding of, of fire is a lot more recent. So maybe you know their experience, or the, the language hasn't caught up with um, your understanding of it. Another thing to explore is just the fact that there's a history of military crossover. So the militaristic language that we're seeing is rooted in the fact that fire um, fighters used military surplus equipment after World War II. Um, they're using an organizational structure that's model off of the military. Um, the aviation operations are almost completely crossed over with special forces. So there's a lot of 
that, that happening. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and move to uh, the last objective. <laughs> and that is, OK, so I have a handful of stories that don't necessarily do a real phenomenal job of supporting the message that we need more fire on the environment. So how do we use these stories to create this more you know, acceptance, uh, acceptance of fire? Um, and that brings me to how I constructed this website. So recognizing that this website is a piece of the puzzle, and hopefully it will become a tool that people use to understand fire, um, I, I, I created it very strategically. I used uh, digital storytelling, oral history techniques, theory of motivated reading, framing theory, and a little bit of reader response criticism. So some time into the humanities here. Um, theory of motivated reading is something that I, I really love. It refers to the unconscious tendency of people to process information in a manner that suits kind of an end goal or a pre-established belief. So it's, it's people hear what they want to hear, right? Um, so people really, really, really want their beliefs to be correct. And so their biases will then skew their, their ability to process information or reason. Um, and it boils down to the fact that we're bad at disconnecting their emotions or our emotions with our reasoning. So when you have someone who's emotionally fearful of fire because of you know, their experience with fire, their knowledge of it, how do you get them to um, take the step of accepting that we might need more fire in the environment? One way I decided to do this was in this teaser video, and I'm going to go ahead and play it in its entirety. Um, but the teaser video is designed to capitalize on that emotional response using imagery and, and messages. And then pose a question just to get them to open up just a little bit to consider that fire. Um, but there's another side of the word, essentially. Did you make this? I did, yes. yes. All right. A massive wildfire exploding in size today. A billowy monster is feeding on bone dry land ready to burn. Flames devour this tree covered hillside. through everything in its path. The blaze looks like a volcano. Mountainsides turn to burn. Wastelands. I've got clues that battling a wildfire in northern Arizona this morning has burned an area the size of 450 football fields. I would say my message would be even though the fire could be large, it, it, it has its good and bad points, and um, not all fire is bad, and not all of the same fire is bad. Fire is done where it was needed, and so is, you know, from the history, it shows that it's always been a good thing to have a little bit of fire in the mountains. Down in Southern California, uh, for instance, that area is tremendously fire adapted. Uh, it's, it's just part of what all, all of uh, the plants in that environment are designed to do. And I think that's a situation where not only does it belong Again, 
and to really help change that public perception of fire. Um, so I use framing theory to, to, to really promote that message. And the idea behind framing theory is that um, you can view a topic from a variety of perspectives. And those perspectives can be construed as having implications on multiple levels. So basically, a framing communication is influencing or interpreting how something is being presented in order to persuade someone to understand our definition of fire. Um, so I did this in a number of ways. I'm going to skip down below here. Every page on the site has a, a header. And that header has strategic imagery um, and a quote that's pulled directly from the firefighter itself. So we just heard this quote, not all fire is bad, and not all of the same fire is bad. Um, the image that I chose to put behind this is a, a section of a fire that has burned through and that, that regeneration is happening. So just to convey that, you know, fire doesn't destroy, it changes, it transforms. So these are on every page, and again, I, the idea behind that is to help frame. So even if the story does use that antagonistic language, ideally they're already thinking in a way that directs them to the ultimate kind of moral of the story that even though these experiences may be intense, they're not necessarily bad, bad for the environment. And I also use some digital storytelling uh, story techniques and oral history techniques. And I'm going to go ahead and take you through uh, the website now. <coughs> okay, I'm fine. So taking you to the public side of the website at this point, there's a number of ways to view the stories. I have um, view stories by person by topic, there's contextualized stories, and then there's a talking map. And um, the stories by person is basically where all of the interviews are hosted, and I have about 20 up at this point. And you can just click on person, and it brings you into their interviews, but they're kind of sliced up into digestible pieces. Nobody needs to sit and listen to an hour and a half interview, um, so I intentionally cut my voice out. I don't like being in front of people, and I don't like being on camera. Um, but more, more importantly, it can combine their responses and their answers to the story into something that somebody might want to, to watch. So you can click through the thumbnails to watch different stories. Importantly, I really crafted the language that describes each video so that it doesn't use emotionally charged language, and it's um, as neutral as possible. So that's the, um, the story. Stories by person is very simple. Stories by topic brings in that digital storytelling element, which allows people to decide how they want to interact with the stories. So if you want to, I, I have a feeling this is going to be the most popular page. If you want to hear the stories about close calls and unexpected incidents, you can resort the videos so that it just shows you those types of stories. Uh, you can sort them by how they view the role of fire in the environment, fire behavior, what kind of critters they encounter? There's some great stories about alligators and Florida and bears up in Alaska. Um, spiking out. Just basically, it allows you to kind of follow the direction that you're interested in when you're, when you're viewing the stories. Contextualized stories. This page um, shows the stories in a number of different formats, but importantly, it provides more context around the stories. So I just have to, it'll show you page five when I'm done. It allows you to watch the story being told. But the transcript is also included down below. Mm -hmm. And you can click on the little tool tips, the little orange text, to pop up a picture of that term along with the definition. And so you can understand a little bit more about what they're saying and, and um, just have more context as you're viewing the story. And then there's a great little word cloud at the bottom um, that just represents the most commonly used term. So this is a favorite among non-firefighting kind of books because it does give you uh, some definitions. And then finally, there's the talk maps. And this is one of the pages that I'm most excited about. I worked with a couple of artists to illustrate um, their interpretations of the stories in, um, with the landscape of the US. So you can click on the map. That's beautiful. Is it? It, it was done by a, a woman who's an air tanker technician. She's done mm -hmm. a hot shot and a repeller and, and so on. Um, but she is a phenomenal artist. I love it. She's a um, uh, Latino and Azteca is, is the influence we're seeing here. So you can hover over the different kind of images in the different states. 
and click on them to watch a video that kind of relates to that topic. This is a great story if you guys want to have a laugh um, about a rookie encountering a, a, a bear that ended up being a <laughs> <laughs> Some really interesting stories. It was funny when I when I was interviewing these folks and I said, yeah, what is your favorite um, place to fight fire? What is what, what story stands out? A lot, a lot of them had Alaska stories, war stories, and Minnesota stories. Even though they fight fire in the West all summer long, it's these, these unique uh, locations that really stood out in their, their mind. So, so this is this is one map I'll just show you the other one. I, I really did work with the artists. Um, without confining them, but I wanted to make sure that the imagery that they used wasn't uh, menacing, because again, that the message is really critical for how, how this website works. Um, the only one that, that to me is, is a little bit menacing is this story here, um, which is about a, a shelter deployment uh, gentleman that survived a burnover. It's very, very moving story. A great story here about a crew that responded to Hurricane Katrina and got a reputation working in a a shelter um, for their ability to do full laundry. <laughs> so some some non-fire stories as well. So the the other pieces, I have some story or some pages that, that people can contribute their videos, their own stories, their photos, um, how fun the project is so I can continue to collect interviews in the future, and then just some more pages about the website. But that's that's pretty much it. This this has really become a passion project. I six years as a hotshot firefighter, so being able to connect with people um, with, fire, with, with hotshot in particular, um, being a hotshot helped me with that ethnographic style interviewing. Um, but I, I got to interview my own, my first superintendent, who's the first woman, female superintendent of the hotshot in the country. And, and I got to interview some folks that started in the 50s. I mean, just a really amazing opportunity to capture this history, capture the story, and then to be able to present them and share them. Um, to me, it's one of the biggest accomplishments I've had in my career to be able to grab these stories and, and just preserve them. That is the Smoky Generation. Thank you. <laughs>
you don't, you can't have to buy beer next time you're in a bar because you're not supposed to, you're not, I guess, you know, trust you to that. represent the agency uh -huh. <laughs> in, the, in the way, you know, their politics might be going on. So they're, they're not, uh, they're definitely not trained in any sort of um, communication techniques for conveying good information about the environment or even their actions. So, so again, you know, that term firefighting itself, it, it's a metaphor for war. Your, yeah. your firefighters are kind of patriotic and um, the is cast as the enemy in a lot of yeah. these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so even the language that they're speaking is their own action reflects that, that metaphor of war is just kind of really prevalent whether or not it, they actually believe it should be. Right. So there is a piece of training that's missing. Um, um, but I, I don't think it's in their understanding. Which they could understand. maybe if someone was supposed to lease yeah. sort out of the media problem right. and political problems facing their members. So the, 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 the history the of Hashat themselves, are, I mean, historically, <laughs> when they started, they were very rambunctious, very rough around the edges. Um, and and so there's not a lot of trust in, in the professionalism. Professionalism has really shifted. Mm -hmm. So I think they be trusted now to convey the message that the, the agencies are quite there yet. Um, let's start in the middle. And yeah, um, yeah, so this disconnect is really interesting. I think it comes up in many fields of practice. And I'm thinking of a metaphor with a similarity with medicine, where doctors practice medicine, they use aggressive language about battling cancer or battling disease. Um, but there's this whole evolutionary basis of disease and everything that doesn't get trained in medical school like we were just talking about, but, um, but that as a doctor you need to have that knowledge of kind of the, the development of whole ecology and evolution of the disease, and yet almost all of medicine is practice, and the way we describe it is all about the action of, of fighting this disease. And, you know, again, if you press, a doctor might say, well, yeah, I know a people or has good uh, things about it, but I want to get rid of the people when I have a you know, kid come into the clinic or whatever. So we just suppress it. So I think if you expanded this out, you'd find so many fields of practice that have the same disconnect between deep knowledge and what is happening at the surface. I, I think so too. And um, one of the reasons why this, this kind of topic interests me so much is because we're faced with this, to me, it's an emotional response response to, you know, to the changes we're seeing in the environment and the impact we're, as humans we've had on the environment, continue to have on the environment, the negative result of that impact. And we, we're, the science behind it is really theory, but the message, it, it's not kind of conveying that sense of urgency that needs to be out there. And so I, I think um, environmental science needs to have like its own marketing firm. <laughs> um, so that, that's, sort of, that's why the message the website is, is so um, important to me because I, I feel like we need to start communicating these messages in a way and, and understanding the root of the language. Um, so that um, Peter brought up actually a good point when I was talking to him that the media can, in the way they manipulate the imagery and the headlines, they, they can engage us in an emotional discussion or an intellectual discussion like that. So let's engage people more in an intellectual discussion without um, diminishing that emotional response, so that, you know, that theory of motivated reasoning, we have to respect the fact that, that we can't just give people more information, expect them to come to our side, we have to really address that emotional connection and really get them there. Yeah. So, are you, so are you linked to um, websites that show the positives of that fire? That show Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Yeah. So this, this yeah. project is, um, it's a work in progress. Yeah, yeah, I hope to, to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say, Stephanie, though, so among the many amazing things you've done, is uh, for your practicum, you did the uh, fire website for the Sierra National Forest and working, you know, all the forests as public information officers um, to try to get out the scope on during an uh, incident, a wildfire incident, for year round. Uh, but if you go to the Sierra National Forest website um, and click through to Bethany composed those pages and, and put them together. Um, it's just really top notch work. Uh, so I want to try.
try to avoid your original joke about the smoke. Yep. But some of the things I may say might seem sensitive. But so as a pros, I just want to say that I've, I've made a living on it and continue to this day. I'm a firefighter in Preston. Uh, this militarization is a circular process. Uh, the language used is also the public's response to this. So Prescott is the epicenter for the subject of emotion because the men were killed last year. And the over romantic, the, the the over heroification connecting wildfire and urban interface firefighting with military national security. Yeah. I'm a firefighter. That's a joke. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I respond to it's, it's all these emotional uh, arguments as a firefighter. I'm just rolling my eyes. And this is a bit of a disclaimer, maybe some advice. Uh, there were tremendous lessons that should have been left. Uh, I mean, what we call the 1018, the Santa Maria is in the middle of half, actually, all, really every single one was broken. But the learning that could have occurred from both the public and the fire industry is completely lost because of the heroification of that event. Mm -hmm. And the hero, they, they were victims. The high line between victims and heroes. And as, as the members of the public, when you see these what appear to be tragedies on the surface, if you get wrapped up in the emotion, the learning possible learning outcomes from those is completely lost. So uh, this is a suggestion uh, in your comment about looking at things from an intellectual and objective. Well, yeah, we do. Uh, firefighters do all the time. Mm -hmm. But the public is getting so wrapped up as these fires get bigger and more homes and more lives. It's just going to get worse with the uh, conditions that are getting less. Uh, avoid that romance the purification of this industry. Yeah. Because as a, the, as a result, the people that should be benefiting from it are not. The are lost. Absolutely, I, I agree with most of what you, you say, and I'd love to have a discussion further. Um, but what I, I would say in the interviews that I did capture, most of the hotshots were incredibly humble. Um, oh, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. And I'm hoping that that can be, because I, I agree, the hero mentality from the public side, from the public side is um, it, it's cute. And um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's a whole other separate issue that could certainly be addressed. And probably at some point does through a website. Like, doesn't and the, the comments about uh, any sense that this isn't occurring, what you're doing is excellent. And I suspect it's going to find its way into uh, the arena. But it's out, out there. Um, I remember when, well, actually, the day after the hot shots were killed, at NBC News led up with an interview from the Hurricane News, uh, pointing out the fact that hey, this should have never happened. It didn't go, that, that was just lost in the, the next 10 minutes. And, yeah, when I say when I say that I agree with most of what you said, I would I would say that there isn't a lot for firefighters to actually learn from that incident because we already knew a lot of that information. Like you said, there were things that were violated and the communication. Right now, everybody's in a court ordered silence because yeah. the state is suing because you broke up, you did too much, and now all the homeowners are suing that you didn't do enough. And that issue of litigation is just enormous. I mean, the story of uh, you know. The Scrapyard that escaped and a homeowner stayed behind during the evacuation and raped the roof of his neighbor because they thought it would be nice. <laughs> Only two houses left standing, the neighbor sued him because everyone else got insurance to rebuild their homes. So, you know, that, that litigation and culture is just, it's just a whole other angle. Yeah. There are many ways to Mismanagement. For example, we build in floodplains, yeah. and yet we insure those houses. <laughs> we build on the wildland interface, and yet we insure those houses, and then uh, put hotshots at considerable risk to protect home and property. When one could argue that in a more helpful society, that was more recognizing of the role of fire in forest ecology, it would not have permitted houses to be that close into the wildlands. And so, and the hot shots, so the culture is uh, profiteering, or maybe that's, maybe that's too loaded in the term, but they are taking advantage of the fact that the hot shots have these, these attitudes of they love the adrenaline. And so they'll go in. If they're told to go in, they go in. As far as a lot of them, probably. And, and yet, 
that many of those goings in probably are avoidable if our society just had a more powerful yeah. dialogue yeah. about fire. Just the challenge that they go in. Maybe not. And then I run into that. I mean, quite, quite honestly, the bad choices be bad choices. I mean, the, the zero application and militarization to public perception is what you can build here because they'll come and say it. And yeah. case in point, where I live and pronouncing where you live, probably indefensible. And when, when you guys are all throwing all these words, it's the first word that came to my mind is hot dogs and marshmallows. Uh, and <laughs> you can look at the sense of loss. But the, the expectation, I think, and you're going to see more and more of that, the expectation that the public, oh, why aren't you going in? We're not going in to a lot of things yeah. because of that. Now, there's going to be huge backlash in the coming years from that. Hot dogs and marshmallows. I mean, there's so many terms like that in the and fire yeah. industry. You know, yeah. you know, like, lightning is the cash register of the guy. You know, so there's all, all that kind of terminology. It's, it's, it's really a complex issue, and and there's, there's a lot of humor to be found, but in that humor is a very real um, consequence mm -hmm. to our, our, our land management decisions, our urban planning decisions, all, all of this. You know, it just, it's a... Uh, it's that's definitely something that should be considered on a system level. Sure. Yeah. Um, question. Yeah, yeah, I have like a like two small questions, like or one comment, one question. I think something like an interesting parallel, maybe like theoretically, just think about over the next like two decades, probably, is like the increase in like coastal resilience response from climate change related storms, and like that because I do see some parallels, just because I first come from both like in terms of colleges and like the litigation caution and like rebuilding and like placement and so I mean I don't know anything really about this like besides like the ecology but I think that's like at least for even like to see what project and how people like that language too it might yeah. be an interesting parallel and the other question was this website is so gorgeous and like how did you like do, do you have a like, background website like how much background how did you that knowledge during your master's. I, I had some web design. I have a small business um, online, so I have some um, web design experience. But this is by far the most technical and, and the steepest learning curve I've had, and it's um, it was a project in and of itself just to learn the technology. But I use it's a WordPress platform, which is a very accessible, user-friendly, easy-to-learn platform. And then a lot of the kind of technical stuff, like the talking about the plugins that I you know, it's twenty dollar plugins that um, I purchased. The contextualized stories page is the most technical page. I hand coded all of those pop ups to happen. So it wasn't just the process of doing it, just finding the pictures, sending the pictures, resetting the pictures, then coding them in, and and um, getting everything to work properly on all the different browsers. Very time consuming. It's been a passion project. And like I said, it, it's something that I'm probably the most proud of. And, and in my career, and um, I'm glad it turned out okay. 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 It's doable. I don't. I'm not a web designer by um, trade or, or training, um, so it, it's doable. And YouTube is your friend. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you so much. Excellent. For those interested.